So several people at this point have asked me if I wouldn't mind going ahead and completing up the math in this video. So I thought I'd do that as a, a second part. I'm going to go through this kind of quickly, but um, I was interested to see that when I look for the equations of motion for this pendulum, there are not very many sources online that actually give it to you in the form that I'm going to do it in this video. There are some sources that give it to you in the form of Hamilton's equations, which are momentum equations, but that's a little bit different. So I'm going to get through this really quickly. I want to make sure the math is there and complete, and then this can serve as an online record for anyone requiring the math in the future. And perhaps I'll also attach these notes from the video to the description below. So just a reminder that in part one, we examined a double compound pendulum, and we found expressions for the kinetic and potential energy, as well as expressions for the location and the velocities. And I've also mentioned previously, it bears repeating, that for the case of pendular problems, it generally is in your best interest to do this in Cartesian coordinates, to derive the equations in Cartesian coordinates, and then eventually to write it in terms of, say, theta, or some sort of angle. So we start by copying equation one from the previous page, the expression for the kinetic energy, and now substitute five and six into equation one and then substituting x1 dot and y1 dot and squaring it gives 1 quarter L1 squared theta 1 dot squared, and then I can group it conveniently as follows as cosine squared theta 1 plus sine squared theta 1, which will reduce to 1, that's a trig identity, plus from the second term now, the contribution is a little bit more involved. It's L1 squared theta 1 dot squared times Again, cosine squared theta 1 plus sine squared theta 1, which reduces to 1, plus 1 quarter L2 squared theta 2 dot squared times cosine squared theta 2 plus sine squared theta 2, which again will reduce to 1, plus, and then the cross product term, L1, L2, theta 1 dot, theta 2 dot times and this can be grouped as cosine theta 1, cosine theta 2, plus sine theta 1, sine theta 2, which is another trig identity that reduces to cosine theta 1 minus theta 2. And then plus the two rotatory kinetic energy terms, 1 half j1 theta dot squared plus 1 half j2 theta 2 dot squared. Then I'm going to rewrite this grouping coefficients of the same coordinate. So let me write it out and then I explain it. That's equal to 1 half times quantity 1 quarter m1 l1 squared plus 1 twelfth m1 l1 squared plus m2 l1 squared times theta 1 dot squared plus 1 half times quantity 1 quarter m2 l2 squared plus 1 twelfth m2 l2 squared times theta 2 dot squared plus 1 half m2 l1 l2 times theta 1 dot theta 2 dot cosine of theta 1 minus theta 2. And then these quantities in the blue are really just constants. They are geometric and material properties. We can go ahead and define these just somewhat arbitrarily. We recognize that they are polar moments of inertia, so I'll call this ja is a third m1 l1 squared plus m2 l1 squared. jb is one third m2 l2 squared. And Jx, which is the cross moment of inertia, is 1 half m2 l1 l2. Put a box around that. Okay, and then making the substitution, we can finally rewrite t in quite a compact form as 1 half j sub a theta 1 dot squared plus 1 half j sub b theta 2 dot squared plus Jx times theta 1 dot theta 2 dot cosine theta 1 minus theta 2. And I realize I need to fix that should be theta 2 dot. And just looking at this very quickly, we can see that JA, this one third M1 L1 squared, is the moment of inertia of a rod about its endpoint. That's in fact what that is. And what we've added to that is M2 L1 squared. So it's like we've added to the first mass a concentrated mass at the other end of it. Similarly, the polar moment of inertia for the second mass is just what we would expect for a rod about its endpoint. 
and this cross product of inertia might be a little bit less obvious. And this is why you derive the equations for pendulum in Cartesian coordinates, because it helps you keep track of the different pieces. Let's number these seven and eight. And a box around it. So next we need to derive an expression for the potential energy, equation number two. And then what we want to do is substitute for y1 and y2, what we derived earlier. So this is equal to minus one half m1 g times l1 cosine theta one minus m2 g times l1 cosine theta one plus l2 over two cosine theta two plus from the spring one half k sub t theta two minus theta one squared. Expanding it out and collecting the coefficients like we did for the kinetic energy, we can rewrite this as V equals negative one half M1 plus M2 all times G L1 cosine theta one minus one half M2 G L2 cosine theta two plus one half K sub T times theta two minus theta one squared. We now recognize that the quantities in blue are just constants. Again, they are material and geometric properties of the system. We rewrite this by defining this as mu one, and I called it mu just because this is a moment, right? And so again, rewriting that in terms of these definitions, V equals minus mu sub one, cosine theta sub one, minus mu sub two, cosine theta sub two, plus one half K sub T theta two minus theta one squared, and that allows us to write it very compactly. This is equation nine, put a box around it. And let's remind ourselves that mu one equals one half M one plus M two G L one. And mu two equals one half M two G L two. Box around that and we give that a number. We proceed by finding the Lagrangian, which is very simply defined as L equals T minus V. We'll call that equation 11. And then substituting the expression for t into that, we get L equals one half j a plus one half j b theta two dot squared plus j x theta one dot theta two dot cosine theta one minus theta two. And then we subtract the potential energy. So we just flip all the signs plus mu one cosine theta one plus mu two cosine theta two minus one half k t times theta two minus theta one squared. Call that equation 12 and put a box around it. We can now proceed by finding our equations of motion. First thing we need to do is we need to write down Lagrange's equations. D by DT of partial L partial Q dot sub I minus partial L partial Q sub I equals capital Q sub I. Call that equation 13. And we found the Lagrangian on the previous page. Let's just paste that here for convenience. Now we consider the coordinate theta one. So substituting equation 12 into equation 13 gives us J a theta one double dot with respect to theta one dot that just cancels out. And then to take the derivative with respect to time, we first got to take the derivative with this multiplied by that, by the rest, then the derivative of this product rule. So the first part of that is we get a JX theta two double dot when we take the derivative of that cosine theta one minus theta two. But then we got to take the derivative of this part and that gives us a minus sign theta one theta two. So minus JX theta two dot sine theta one minus theta two. And then remember, because we're taking the time derivative, we need to differentiate that with respect to time two. And that gives us theta one dot minus theta two dot. Then for the second part, we need to subtract partial L partial theta one. And the terms that survive here, there's a theta one in this term, in this term, and in this term. So when we take the derivative of this with respect to theta one, so minus JX theta one dot theta two dot sine of theta one minus theta two. Cosine derivative gives you a minus sign. And plus kt theta two minus theta one. The reason for the plus here is when I take the derivative of the inside, I get a minus that cancels the other minus. 
and all that is equal to the external moment acting on coordinate 1, and that's m of t. Now we can expand this out by multiplying this term out, and also multiplying the negative through, and we end up with this where a couple of the terms can cancel. And that's it. So rewriting it minus the cancel terms, we see that ja theta 1 double dot plus jx cosine theta, min cosine theta 1 minus theta 2 times theta 2 double dot plus jx sine theta 1 minus theta 2 times theta 2 dot squared plus mu 1 sine theta 1 minus kt times theta 2 minus theta 1 equals m of t. Call that equation 13 and put a box around it, and that is our first equation of motion. In order to find the second equation of motion, we can proceed in exactly the same way. Let me copy that from the previous page. And now we consider the coordinate theta 2. And just like what we did before, I end up with jb theta 2 double dot. I'll take the derivative using the product rule. So it's plus jx theta 1 double dot cosine theta 1 minus theta 2 minus theta 1 minus theta 2 times theta 1 dot minus theta 2 dot. And again, I remind you, don't leave out that part. Minus, and now this part here, partial L partial Q sub I. And from this term, we get plus J X dot sine theta 1 minus theta 2. The reason for the plus sign here is we get a minus sign when we take the derivative of the cosine. Then when we take the derivative of the inside here, we get a minus 1 because that's minus theta 2. And then from this term here, we're going to get a negative mu 2 sine theta 2. And then from this term here, we get minus k sub t times theta 2 minus theta 1. And all of this is equal to 0, since there's no externally applied moment on that coordinate. Just like we did before, I'm going to expand this out by multiplying this out and multiplying through here by the negative sign. And when I do that, I find there's some terms that can cancel. This is equal to 0. So now we're done with the second equation of motion. All that remains is to pick out the surviving terms, and that leaves us with jb theta 2 double dot plus jx cosine theta 1 minus theta 2 times theta 1 double dot minus jx sine theta 1 minus theta 2 times theta 1 dot squared plus mu 2 sine theta 2 plus kt theta 2 minus theta 1 is equal to 0 number 14 and put a box around it. So before finishing this video I thought it would be useful to compare the equations we derived here to the equations we derived for the double simple pendulum. A link to that appears above. So first we'll look at the theta 1 equations and I've written in a form just to try to highlight that actually the two are very very similar. The bottom equation is for the simple pendulum and the top one is the compound pendulum. Notice that all the terms have the same coordinates. They all have the same signs. All that's different here are the coefficients, which should be expected because the difference in the two problems is really just a mass distribution. That's all that's different. You would expect the mechanical behavior to be very similar in terms of the equations. And this is what we find. Let's put a box around these two. So in examining the theta 2 equations, and again, they look pretty similar. The coordinates are the same. The terms look the same other than the coefficients. The important part is all the signs are the same. Does this guarantee us that these equations we derived here are correct? No, it certainly doesn't. But we would notice immediately if they were wrong. I mean, if these equations didn't match up, then chances are pretty good that we've done something wrong. Anyhow, that's all I'd like to say about this video. I hope you have found something useful in it. If you have, please go ahead and smash those like buttons. It really helps get other people to see it. If you have any questions, comments, criticisms for me, I'd love to hear about them in the comments section below. If you'd like to be notified of any future video releases, please hit those subscribe buttons and click on the bell. Thank you very much for watching, and I will catch up with you in the next video.